Thank you. Uh, yes, I um, uh, will talk about um, a work in progress. Uh, but before I start, I will just say that, uh, uh, as Sanne said, I'm uh, a professor at the Malmö Academy of Music. And I'm also uh, one of the editors, the sub-editor. The main editor is sitting over there <laughs> for STM, <laughs> Swedish uh, Journal for Music Research. And this year, um, 2019 is the centenary uh, jubilee for the um, journal. And uh, if any of you would have uh, the, um, an interest in writing a short uh, notice on the development of research in Sweden or uh, related to Sweden, you are very welcome because though there are still some space in this, uh, there's still some space in the journal for such uh, texts. So you could look at the home page in that case. So that was outside of this presentation. <laughs> Um, because that num that uh, number will um, center around the um, uh, history and the development of Swedish music research, um, which is an interesting topic, <coughs> and it's welcome welcoming from all disciplines that occupy themselves with music research. Okay. Um, Yes, I'm. Uh, my background is in uh, both music education research and artistic research, and the reason, uh, or my main interest, and the context for this presentation, is my interest in the future of the music profession and of the performer as composer or uh, instrumentalist and so on, and related to higher music education. Uh, what kind of um, role does artistic research play in that context, and what can uh, wh what will the future be for performers and um, ensembles in our music culture? I think that's a very interesting question, which is my main question that permeates all my projects. I've done projects in improvisation. Uh, high music education, choral research, and so on. So this is <coughs> um, uh, a, foc a project that focused on the performer and composer collaboration and interaction in, um, on the organ in relationship to the historical repertoire for this particular instrument. And I think this project falls under the headings for this day, which were how the results of the presented research can contribute to the present and future fields of musical, research fields of musical practices, and how future artists and researchers can benefit from the field in general. Um, because these fields are, uh, as I see it, risking the field of music performance, it's not so much avant-garde and renewing itself today, as it perhaps could be. And in this context, I think artistic research can play an important role as energizing, questioning, um, digging up things from uh, underneath and so on, and putting new questions. For me, the key interest is with the project is the notion that performers and composers as agents in the field of music making carry in their practices, in their bodies and in their actions, what might be called aesthetic discourses or traditions or something else that are not always outspoken. And here I speak from the perspective of the performer. And uh, this particular project could be, in his terminology, seen as uh, a research for the arts, I would say. And the, this project was a kind of byproduct of a larger product, which was called Musical Rhetoric in Contemporary, Contemporary Rituals. And this project held a row of concerts of music by Buxtehude, uh, and new music performed by four organists, and its aim was to instigate a discussion around questions like uh, these. 
what is the meaning and relevance of performances of historical works in contemporary concert culture? What is the function of the practice and art of interpretation today? If any, I mean, th those are open questions. What is the performer's voice? And um, now this, uh, this is uh, situated in the area of organ music, but that's just an example. It could be in another field. And there are uh, other projects in other instrumental practice fields. Uh, so this is uh, one example of such a project. The organ is an instrument that is loaded with musical heritage and ritual conventions. It has been, through history, a flexible music machine that easily incorporated and developed new aesthetic and technical tendencies. The organist, as a performer, has acted as a meeting point for genres and styles, written music and oral traditions, and embodies the tension between representing musical history and or the avant-garde, if there is such a thing today. You could really put that question, because in this practice, um, the avant-garde uh, profile is, uh, I would say, almost completely gone. And um, the organist, as a representative of a state institution and a musical practice, which was locally uh, situated and widely um, received, is not the same. So that uh, creates a, a completely different situation. It's slow here. Yeah. The development of the organ is closely linked to Western European cultural development, of course. The output of repertoire is unbroken since at least the 14th century, and it's one of the largest for a solo instrument. The profession has incorporated changing views of music, scores, playing and performing from every period of history, but has not discarded them, as is the case with most, of the, most other classical musicians in their practices. For example, a normal classical musician today does not improvise, and that has a lot of uh, explanations, which I will not go into now. Roughly speaking, uh, their performance practice still contain two relationships to notated works, of which the first one is historically the youngest, um, the one above, where the, you see the score as the composer's individual piece of artwork to be interpreted and realized. And uh, the lower one, the score as a starting point for copying and further development by the performer and as a tool for uh, promoting improvisatory skills. Uh, so these two uh, approaches or ways of using scores uh, are both uh, active in this practice. And this can be compared to Stefan Östergaard's distinction between analytic interpretation and thinking through practice. Um, and of course, it relates to the view and the perception of the musical work and the work concept, uh, which I, in other studies, have um, gone into and um, discussed that with organists, they, they don't have the same development in their practice as other musicians in the Western music history concerning this issue with a musical work because this double attitude has remained. And the pre-modern view on scores, as an example of how to improvise, has remained. And um, while the modern work concept and the corresponding notions of authenticity have evolved, along with the modern notion of the composer. So this practice is uh, old-fashioned and modern, uh, and maybe it can also develop I don't know that. Um, and in what became this project, I commissioned an organ piece from four composers um, and asked them to do it with a relationship to historical repertoire. In this case, it was uh, music by Buxtehude, since the larger project was in this area. And also with any degree of collaboration with me as a performer. And the composer, you can ask who is a composer, and these composers uh, are composers who define themselves as composers and have published pieces in 
composed pieces. Uh, and the, the question for me was intentionally somewhat vague, since I wanted their interpretation of the task and their ways of going about it. So there were four composers, and the first performance was in August two, th two years ago. And uh, the ambition is to also make a recording of these pieces and um, publications, but that has not happened yet. Uh, so I will now briefly describe the processes and the products of the project. My initial interest concerned the present state of agency of performers on this particular instrument in their interaction with historical performance practice and in collab collaboration with contemporary composers. However, the, the project pointed to some aspects that were unexpected to me and um, uh, you could say they were about meetings, what might be called aesthetic cultures, discourses and traditions be between uh, um, different, yeah, different cultures, you could say. Uh, maybe I can illustrate that a little bit. Um, so this was the um, pro this was the program for the concert where the pieces were intermingled with the uh, relevant pieces or related pieces by Buxtehude and some theoretical input. Um, and the resulting four products looked somewhat similar uh, at a glance, uh, but the four processes uh, varied wide, uh, they differed a lot in scope as well as in content and concerning the interactive process and the performance experience of working with the scores and, and the product, the sounding music. Um, mm -hmm. Like this relationship and this one. And this one. And that is, of course, not surprising. Um, but we will now have a look at these four cases. Uh, the process of the first case was <coughs> like this. Started with a dialogue around the project. Then I received a score. I worked on that, and then the concert took place. The second uh, was also contained a dialogue, and is a meeting where um, or, uh, the p composer listened to recordings of mine and the score and then a workshop with a valuable va a dialogue on different aspects, practicing and the concert. The third one uh, was with somebody who had already listened to, knew, who knew me as a musician and made uh, sketches based on this knowledge and then followed a couple of workshops and uh, with the recordings of these sketches and then uh, some other work and the concert. And then the fourth one was a very long process or very um, many aspects of a process uh, of interaction um, and it all started actually in uh, um, um, focusing on the performance techniques or specific sounds produced by specific ways of uh, playing, which I, as a performer, would then kind of uh, import into my technique. And that was not easy. Uh, so that took a long... Uh, that took, uh, and it's not finished yet. And this was a very interesting project for me, and I think also for performers in general. Um, and you could say it's all it's uh, ongoing still, um, because this work is not uh, finished with the product on paper. You could say. So I will just give some um, examples from each of these uh, pro uh, cases. Uh, of the this first one contained short discussions about form, very. Uh, uh, short and the product if, if, if maybe you recognize the structure this is a piece by Buxtehude uh, but not still because all the uh, notes are uh, transposed so uh, it would sound something like uh, I think it will be coming here up 
like this. And so on. So this goes on until the end. And the experience from, from on my part was a really um, strong sense of provocation. What is this? What is the identity of this as a piece of music? And what is my contribution to this process? Why should I do this? And what does it say? So this was really difficult for me, and I. Um, have not really come over that <laughs> trauma yet. <laughs> because I couldn't see the point of, of this um, score, actually. So we'll leave it up there for a moment. And uh, this second um, case, it contains several discussions on different levels about form, content, uh, meaning, and so on. And uh, the piece was a development, or you could say related to uh, uh, fragments from Buxtude's uh, F-sharp minor prelude and fugue. And um, we, yeah, we had some really valuable uh, discussions about registration and sound and so on at the start of this work. And uh, for me, uh, it was uh, a lot of work realizing the score on the particular instrument. It was hard work. I had a clip here where, from my practicing, but I will not play that now. It was very funny. But um, the the end product started like this. It's. and so on. Uh, for me, this was, uh, uh, as I said, hard work, but also very satisfactory. And I didn't experience any um, questioning of why I uh, why is to do this. Uh, I, I liked this very much. And uh, it fit into my normal uh, way of practicing uh, composed, uh, notated repertoire. So it was, uh, in that way, easy. And this is the rest of the piece. And then the third uh, s uh, process contained a lot of workshops at the instrument. And here the, uh, the notation was incomplete in a way. Let's see. Like the, uh, you can't really see it here. Um, with parts where the performer was supposed to take over and continue and develop something in the same style. And uh, that was uh, not so unusual for me, but um, it meant it could be d very different from time to time. Here is a short example. and so on. So this kind of challenged the ways of the hand, you can speak of that, uh, and the tendency to fall into comfortable improvisatory patterns that you already have integrated in your technique. So here the specific issue was to develop this particular material, which was also developing for the performer. And um, the fourth case, uh, contained all these aspects as we looked at before, and uh, dialogues in different formats. 
And here, the, the product was a sketch-like notation where the uh, realization, therefore, will vary depending on the situation, on the instrument, on the performer's mood, on the temperament and the ability, and so on. And my experience was that it uh, encouraged and demanded a completely different attitude and approach, another mindset, so to speak. And even though I'm used to improvising, um, it meant uh, a sense of sinking into or the meditation on the uh, process as playing and having a courage to remain in uh, something that is set in motion. A uh, way of, uh, I know Stefan talked about thinking through hearing and so on. You could, you could say that that was a good example of this, uh, not thinking through playing or acting. I mean, when you're playing you, or improvising, the hand helps you to do things because you, you get feedback from the hand. But here was more thinking through listening. And this was really interesting to work on. And the score is then based on certain ways of playing and using the instrument. So it's more based on the practice, you could say. So here are some uh, discussions about how to realize those different uh, unfinished um, instructions that were in the score, because that was just a, a symbol in a way. So it required a lot of extra material. And then we had to hear some example. We also had these kinds of conversations and created different versions. And these versions are very interesting because this composer recorded examples herself, which I then tried to uh, internalize into my playing. And that was not at all easy, and they are very interesting to compare because she is not an organist, but she has a picture of what the sound should be like and so on. And this will be uh, the topic of a more in-depth study, this kind of interaction later. Um, so here are some examples. So. It, As you hear, it uses the mechanical organ's capacity to change the, the sound. Maybe we'll, we can hear a short, very short. Ah, this is... This is in the concert. The first piece by Buxtehude. And then, at the end of this piece, And so on. So this this piece transformed into the second one, or this one, and um, uh, it was not based on any particular piece, but kind of I think they are called like ghost preludes. So they are kind of mirroring or reflecting existing historical music. Um, so. Um, as, as I mentioned, the organist profession, or habitus, encompasses the layers of approaches to scores. 
And these are not in a position to each other in this practice, but rather they, uh, they can be illustrated as um, a floating relationship between uh, the interpretation and, uh, of scores and the improvisation. So if that is the organist, then you can kind of move on this uh, scale in relation to uh, making music. And uh, I previously studied how performing musicians position themselves on this scale in relation to institutional performance contexts, such as the liturgy and the concert, which for organists are coupled to differing aesthetics and relationships to score. In this case, the framework and the musicians' positionings relate to the four individual composers' aesthetics, which is interestingly enough displayed four different positions here. If you see, uh, I would say that the, the, they place themselves like this. The first composer I don't know where to put, so I just uh, put it somewhere. <laughs> um, and <laughs> um, so I, I think that projects such as this, um, let's see if I had another picture here. No, is this, um, they instigate questions that may be uh, put also in other musical practices. And um, the, the dialogue and interaction between the composers and the performers, uh, I think can be developed in the practice because in today you have to ask questions such as what what is a performer today what is it to be a performer and what is it to be a composer and how should you interact because in this practice before maybe uh, in the 50s 60s 70s it was quite normal to commission pieces from contemporary composers and uh, create a context where new music was performed and uh, uh, maybe debated but that's not very common today, uh, which I think is uh, very um, uh, alarming because you cannot go on, uh, especially in this practice, there is a risk to become a museum of very good music, of course, but it's not, uh, it's not contemporary and it doesn't relate to questions uh, that we are um, engaging in and that are important to us. So um, from my position of uh, also active in higher music education, I think um, that projects in artistic research can really put those questions in a very uh, loud way also, I think. That is good. Okay, thank you. <laughs>